Lord, I just thank you for the privilege for myself to be here. Lord, that you are just shining light upon all of us here at this time in our history. And Lord, that uh, I just want to be a part of this, Lord. Amen. And Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us take this into our hearts, Lord, and that we run with it. Father, we just uh, we lift up uh, Jeff as he's about to speak, Lord, and we ask you to anoint him. And Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to be present and that you send angels that excel, excel in strength, Lord, to keep the powers of darkness away from each of our hearts. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity. And Lord, we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple questions that, that I heard, have heard. Um, about what Russell's saying, that I was involved with some of the answers to what I've heard, but it was in a small group that I think I'll take time very briefly to share how I'm understanding the answer. And, and it's this, that there are prophecies in the Bible that I call triple applications of prophecy. There may be a better way to express it. Um, the three abominations of desolation uh, are a classic example. The three Elijahs, Elijah the first, Elijah the second, John the Baptist, Elijah the third, God's people at the end of the world. Uh, the three Romes, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and modern Rome. And the three woes are ones that we will probably talk about in this prophecy school as we proceed. And when we find triple applications of prophecy in the Bible, we find that the characteristics that are established in the first two times that these prophecies are fulfilled are identifying the characteristics of the third fulfillment. So the question was raised concerning the chart, which on the chart, as Haskell says, um, that the second woe comes to a conclusion in 1840. And uh, we're suggesting here that the second woe comes to a conclusion in 1844. And the reason, one of the reasons, just one of the reasons, there are several biblical reasons for this, but one of the reasons that you can make this case is from understanding triple applications of prophecy. The first two applications of prophecy are going to identify the events of the third application. And we know that in the third woe, which began to sound, and this is according to the Bible and the pioneers of Adventism, the, the third woe, the seventh trumpet, began on October 22nd, 1844. And uh, as Russell was saying this morning, and he was using spirit of prophecy to confirm it, and as the pioneers taught and believed, the third woe continues until the end of the thousand years at the destruction of the wicked. Um, he did a very nice job of breaking that out for us, the, the distinction um, between the nations being angry, which is taking place now, the wrath of God, which is the seven last plagues, and the judgment of the dead. And Sister White is clear they take place in sequential order and that they're different events. Therefore, the judgment of the dead in that sequence has to be the judgment of the dead at the end of the thousand years. It's not the judgment of the dead that began on October 22nd, 1844, because that would be putting it in front of it, in front of it, the day of God's wrath and also in front of uh, the angering of the nations. But in any case, the third woe goes until that time period. But we know that from October 22nd until that time period, one of the ta things that takes place is the raising up of the 144,000. And the raising up of the 144,000 takes place in a repetition of the pioneer movement. Uh, the pioneer movement fulfilled the parable of the ten virgins to the very letter, and it would be fulfilled again to the very letter. Therefore, in the third woe, we have the history of the Lord purifying and raising up his final remnant people through an increase of knowledge. Therefore, if you stop the second woe at 1840 and you do not include the time period from 1840 to 1844, you're taking the history of the Millerite movement out of the second woe and in terms of a triple application of prophecy, you're taking the most one of the most important characteristics, at least, of the first two times the woes are fulfilled, and you're eliminating it, therefore not confirming and establishing it in the third woe, and we know it's there in the third woe. So the second woe would encompass that time period because it's setting forth the pattern of the third woe. Is that how you were understanding? Okay. Um, now... The parable of Adventism. This is um, one of my favorite studies, and it begins to 
uh, move us a little bit deeper into the Millerite time period and what that means to us. Publishing ministry, page 175. Again and again I've been shown that the past experiences of the people of God are not to be counted as dead facts. We are not to treat the record of these experiences as we would treat last year's almanac, a last year's almanac. The record is to be kept in mind, for history will repeat itself. The darkness of the mysteries of the night is to be illuminated with the light of heaven. The past experiences of of God's people here is not simply the past experiences of the, God's people in the Bible, it's the past experiences also of the Millerite Advent movement. And, and I don't just mean Millerite. Um, even in the early part of last century, uh, the histories of the Alpha time with uh, Kellogg and what was going on there, we've plainly been told this is, this is a history that gets repeated at the end in the Omega. So it's the it's the whole history of modern Israel is a lesson for us if we would understand it. Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 270. The parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself and every specif specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. We are represented either by the wise or foolish virgins. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we the authority to say who are wise and who are foolish. There are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness and these appear outwardly like the wise. But of all the specifications here that Sister White mentions, she places her emphasis on the closing of the door. When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation and it becomes an abiding influence. This is what we need here, is for the third angel's message to become an abiding influence in each and every heart among us. It must be attended with divine power or it will accomplish nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom are wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. And brothers and sisters, the third angel's message became present truth on October 22nd, 1844, when the door was opened into the most holy place and light shone out of the ark of God. That's when the third angel's message became present truth, but one of the characteristics of the third angel's message is it has a, a second time that it becomes present truth. It becomes present truth in a, in a more distinct way at the Sunday law, which the third angel's message is identifying, a warning against um, accepting the Sunday law. And this is true with the parable of the ten virgins. It was fulfilled in the Millerite time period, but there will come a time when once again it becomes present truth and is fulfilled again, and it is happening as we speak. The Great Controversy, page 393, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. Early Writings, page 15, at this I raised my eyes, and I saw a straight and narrow path cast high above the world. On this path the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which the angel told me was the midnight cry. The midnight cry was the bright light at the beginning of the movement. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. Brothers and sisters, there is bright light in understanding the midnight cry. Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard the voices of angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Someone asked me, here a question this week. I don't know if it was a trick question or just a simple curiosity. It says, who is it uh, that proclaims, behold, the bridegroom cometh in the parable? And I heard the voices of angels crying, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. This was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. The most talented men were not the first to receive this message. The most talented men were not the first to receive this message. 
Angels were sent to humble devoted ones and constrain them to raise the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Those entrusted with the cry made haste and in the power of the Holy Spirit sounded the message and aroused their discouraged brethren. This work did not stand in the wisdom and learning of men, but in the power of God. And his saints who heard the cry could not resist it. The most spiritual received the message first and those who had formerly led in the work were the last to receive and help swell the cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. In every part of the land light was given upon the second angel's message and the cry melted the hearts of thousands. It went from city to city and from village to village until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. In many churches the message was not permitted to be given and a large company who had the living testimony left these fallen churches. A mighty work was accomplished by the midnight cry. The message was heart-searching, leading the believers to seek a living experience for themselves. They knew that they could not lean upon one another. That's what happens here at the end, is those people that are going to be among the 144,000, they become the living testimony. That's the purpose of this little book that increases knowledge. William Miller's brought a message, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to dissect the Millerite time period, and I, I obviously I'm aware that there are many uh, historical points up there in the Millerite time period that I haven't put in. I, I didn't put in 1843, the first disappointment. I've put selected out of there um, things I wanted to emphasize. The first thing I wanted to emphasize is what William Miller's message was. Great Controversy 309. To prepare people to stand in the day of God, a great work of reform was to be accomplished. God saw that many of his professed people were not building for eternity, and in his mercy, he was about to send a message of warning to arouse them. What's arouse mean? Awaken. Awaken from their stupor and lead them to make ready for the coming of the Lord. William Miller had a warning of a message of warning, arousal, and preparation. Threefold message. A warning message. And, of course, the third angel's message is the most fearful warning ever proclaimed. But it is also a message that awakens and brings conviction that we must prepare our character. A warning, arousal, and preparation message. And what was his message? Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That was William Miller's message. It was based upon the book of Daniel. Let's, let's make that note here. It was based upon the book of Daniel because the time period of Miller is going to be fulfilled again to the very letter. And of course, we already mentioned it's a warning, arousal, and preparation message. It was also the first angel's message. Great Controversy 368. To William Miller and his, and his co-labors, it was given to preach the warning in America. This country became the center of the great Advent movement. It was here that the prophecy of the first angel's message had its most direct fulfillment. The writings of Miller and his associates were carried to distant lands. Wherever missionaries had penetrated in all the world were sent the glad tidings of Christ's speedy return. Far and wide spread the message of the everlasting gospel. Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come. William Miller's message was the first angel's message. It was announcing that judgment was beginning and the judgment of the dead did begin, and it was a close of probation message. He was telling the world that, uh, the, the people of the world, that the world was about to be destroyed by the fires of Christ's second coming, and that their probation was about to close. It was based upon the book of Daniel. It was a warning, arousal, and preparation message. And it arrived in history in the time period that we understand to be the time period of the Philadelphian church. So, I'm going to walk over to the board and just walk through this timeline here. Remember, prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. And the historical events were set before the people to show the fulfillment of prophecy. So, William Miller actually began to share before 1833, but I have 1833 up here for two reasons. One of them's minor. This is when he received his credentials to preach. But what's the other one? The falling of the stars. This, this year is a, a time period that we can 
mark as the preparation for the Millerite movement. What were they preparing for? They were preparing for this time period here. Um, the, and the Lord was attempting to prepare the world too, also. And during this time period, Will, William Miller began to proclaim a message based upon Daniel 8:14, which is a warning preparation and arousal message. And uh, there comes a time period um, when power comes into the movement. And what, what is that time period? August 11th, 1840, um, on a fulfillment of prophecy, Daniel, or Revelation 9.15, the 391-year, 15-day prophecy um, was predicted by the pioneers. Uh, the world did not believe it, but when it came to pass, it brought power into the movement. What also happened simultaneously? Uh, the angel of Revelation 10 come down out of heaven, that angel being uh, Christ, and he came down of he out of heaven with a little book in his hand, and from 1840 onward, we have uh, the Millerite time period that Sister White over and over again portrays this history in the terms of the parable of the ten virgins. Um, in 1842, the organized churches began to close their door on the Millerites, and the second angel's message arrived in history. The Millerites came to understand that Babylon was fallen, that the organized churches were rejecting um, this message of William Miller. And then at some point um, in in the, the final year, 1844, um, there was new light that came into the Millerite movement. And they needed the new, well, they needed the new light probably for a variety of reasons. But the first disappointment that took place in 1843 had taken some of the wind out of their sails. They'd lost their zeal. They were still proclaiming the message. But they, were, uh, they had reached the, the blessed hour, as Russell's calling it, of 1843 in fulfillment of the 1335 uh, year time prophecy, they, they, were, they hung in there, they knew it was the message, um, but their zeal had been taken out by the first disappointment, and the, the way that the Lord um, aroused them um, to this time period was from a, uh, some new light from Bible prophecy based upon the message that they'd been proclaiming, Daniel 8, 14, and when this new light that they had discovered um, was fulfilled, the door closed, and the new light was that they found in Scripture uh, passages that allowed them to calculate the very beginning point of the 2300-day prophecy, which allowed them to calculate not simply 1844, but October 22nd, 1844. And when October 22nd, 1844 arrived, um, the door closes on the virgins. That's basically <coughs> the, the pattern we want to set forth here. I want to point out here that the, the prophecy that brings the that the Lord used to bring power in the Millerite movement was the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, a collapse of a great empire, because these things will be fulfilled again to the very letter. So what is our message as we repeat this history here at the end? Testimonies, Volume 8, 252-53. We are living in the closing scenes of this earth's history. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. The hours of probation are fast passing. We have no time, not a moment to lose. Let us not be found sleeping on guard. Let no one say in his heart or by his works, My Lord delayeth his coming. Let the message of Christ soon return sound forth in earnest words of warning. Let us persuade men and women everywhere to repent and flee from the wrath to come. Let us arouse them to immediate preparation. For we little know what is before us. Let ministers and lay members go forth into the ripening fields to tell the unconverted and indifferent to seek the Lord while he may be, may be found. The workers will find their harvest wherever they proclaim the forgotten truths of the Bible. They will, will find those who will accept the truth and will devote their lives to winning souls for Christ. Okay, I don't have it, so I'll tell it to you. One of the quotes that we've read um, uh, probably a couple times so far from the Great Controversy says, the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble have been clearly revealed, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important events than if they'd never been revealed. And the point that I would like to suggest to you is that the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble, they've been clearly revealed, but they've been forgotten. They've been lost sight of. They're as if they've never been revealed. And in this particular quote here, if you notice the last sentence, sentence 
two sentences. It says, the workers, you and I, the workers will find their harvest wherever they proclaim the forgotten truths of the Bible. And the forgotten truths of the Bible are the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble. If you want to have success as a soul winner, as someone that's bringing in the sheaves here at the end of the world, then proclaim the forgotten truths of the Bible. And as you do, you will be proclaiming a warning and an arousal and a preparation message. And this is the message that William Miller was proclaiming. But his message was Daniel 8, 14. And our message is Revelation 14, the three angels' message. It's a little bit different in terms of where it's founded in Scripture. But William Miller was the one that brought the first angels' message. And yes, we are to teach the first angels' message, but we are the people of the third angels' message. William Miller was to announce to the world that judgment was about to begin, and we were to announce to the world that judgment is about to close. William Miller's message became present truth when the judgment of the dead began, and our message becomes present truth in the time period of the judgment of living. There's close parables, but distinct differences. William Miller's message was based upon the book of Daniel. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 106-107. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel, Daniel, which related to the last days. The scripture says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. That happened in the Millerite movement. It's happening now. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made, time shall be no longer. See Revelation 10.6. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. By the increase of knowledge, a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. Dropping down a couple paragraphs, it says, In the first angel's message, men are called upon to worship God, our Creator, who made the world and all things that are therein. They've paid homage to an institution of the papacy, making of no effect the law of Jehovah, but there is to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. There is to be an increase of knowledge on the making of no effect the law of Jehovah in conjunction with paying homage to the papacy. There is to be an increase of knowledge from the book of Daniel on the Sunday law. And brothers and sisters, that's found in Daniel 11, 40-45. Hosea 4, 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. This knowledge is life or death. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Proverbs 10, 14. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So if the wise shall understand, and the wise are the wise virgins, who are the wicked? The foolish virgins that are destroyed. Why? because of a lack of knowledge. Now, I mentioned this at some point yesterday, this quote. I, I didn't read it, but I pointed forward to it. It's just before the Sunday Law, there's a power that comes in the movement as God's people that are the wise virgins see these things approaching and bring their life into agreement with that. There's a power that comes into this message. It says, Here the, heretofore, those who presented the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Anyone here ever been called an alarmist? <laughs> Wear it as a bad, badge of distinction. If you're giving the message, you're going to get called an alarmist. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced groundless and absurd. But as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching. And the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. Amen. Now, we're talking about when the Sunday law is widely agitated in this passage. When the Sunday law is widely agitated, are the foolish virgins going to recognize it? No, they're not. 
In fact, Russell's been reading a quote where they're going to see that light and they're going to call it darkness. So, who is going to see it agitated? The wise, the wise virgins are going to see it agitated. Now, when are they going to see it agitated? As it's approaching. As it's approaching. And what have we been told about the Sunday Law? One of the things we've been told is that it, the movement for Sunday legislation is going on in darkness. It's all progressive. It's going on in darkness. Certainly right before we get to the Sunday Law, it's going to be out in the open and in the press, but it's going to start popping out a little bit here and there uh, for those who will see to see. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying to you that if you have the eyes to see today, you can see that... <laughs> The movement for Sunday legislation is happening now. It can be recognized. Um, what Ron, some of the things Ron had uh, last night about setting up uh, the Vatican here in the United States, if that isn't uh, telling us that the Sunday law is coming, coming, then we need some more spiritual discernment. It can be recognized now if we will see it. And in that case, it's time that this message is empowered as it could not have been heretofore now. This message is not given in the Philadelphian time period. It's given in the Laodicean time period. And that changes the dynamics a little bit. The Philadelphians were on fire for the Word of God. We're keeping the Word of God outside of us and believing that we have it inside of us. Um, distinctly different situation. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 364, 365. The dealings of God with His people should be often repeated. How frequently were the waymarks set up by the Lord in dealing with His ancient Israel? We are exhorted to call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. For His people in this generation, the Lord has wrought as a wonder-working God. The past history of the cause of God needs to be often brought before the people, young and old. We need often to recount God's goodness and praise Him for His wonderful works. Sister White here is talking about the past history of Adventism, saying that we need to repeat those way marks. She quotes Hebrews 10.32 and points to, which emphasizes that there was a time period in uh, Adventism when God's people were illuminated. When was that? That was in 1840 to 1844. That's when the angel of Revelation 10 came down and the message went to every missionary station in the world. And we need to remember that history. And generally in Adventism, we know nothing about that history. Miller began to preach in 1833, Great Controversy 333. In 1833, two years after Miller began to present in public the evidences of Christ soon coming, the last of the signs appeared, which were promised by the Savior as tokens of his second advent. Said Jesus, the stars shall fall from heaven. And John in the Revelation declared as he beheld and visioned the scenes that should herald the day of God, the stars of heaven fell into earth, unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This prophecy received a striking and impressive fulfillment in the great meteoric shower of November, November 13th, 1833. What's the date? 11th, 11th. <laughs> but notice she ties William Miller's preaching in with 1833. It's not, it's not, it's not a proof text about anything, but notice that she does. Movement Empowered. In the year 1840, another remarkable, remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in AD 1840, sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before de Cozies ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of the Christian nations. If you were listening closely to Russell this morning, I'm sure that we all were. Um, he points to a time period 
um, back in the Millerite time period that, that this is dealing with, when the European powers came together to settle the question of Islam. And he, if you caught it, he was saying that here at our time period, once again, the, the modern fruition of the European powers is once again coming together to settle the problem of radical Islam. Because the United Nations is simply the modern extension of the dragon power that has come down through history in different places. And the seven European kings of Daniel 7 were the dragon power. And they're, today they're doing the same thing. They're coming together to settle the problem of Islam. That's not what we're dealing with here, but let's move on. And uh, the, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. How many of you realize that in Adventism, there is a, at least a small group of people uh, that believe that this passage of the great controversy was inserted by Uriah Smith. There's people that actually believe this. They do not believe that Sister White penned this. They believe that Uriah Smith snuck this in. Because this is very, very close to what he wrote in Daniel and Revelation. And, and they're also trying to raise other question marks about the writings of Ellen White, but they make this point. But my point is, this is the foundation of Adventism, and we were warned that it would come under attack. This is the foundation of Adventism because this is where power came into the movement, and the way that it brought power into the movement, the logic of it was that when this came to pass, the whole world recognized that was watching that the year-day principle that William Miller had been using to predict that the end of the world was just around the corner was valid, and that's why power came into the movement. So if you can destroy uh, Josiah Litch's reasoning on August 11th, 1840, then what you're really destroying is the year-day principle, and you're destroying October 22nd, 1844. And sure enough, in Adventism today, there's people that make that argument. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates. And a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and publishing his views. And from 1840 to 1844, the work rapid, rapidly extended. For those of you in this prophecy school, not for those of you that may be listening to this or watching this on some kind of production, Brother Duane can tell you about that New York Extra Tribune over there on the wall, both the front and back. And you should hear the story, the history that's with that little chart uh, is important to understand about how the work was uh, catapulted during this time period. Okay, because William Miller was basically going along preaching, 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 and the only kind of public uh, publicity he was getting is when the newspapers in the town he was in was ridiculing him and attacking him, and he, but he just continued on. But when he joined forces with Josiah Litch, just, was it Josiah Litch? Heim says, we got to do some, some publicity campaign here. We need to start making this front and center before everybody's eyes. And so the Lord brought people together to catapult it. And, and you need to ask Dwayne about that chart, but that's outside the scope of this presentation. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us. Testimonies and Ministers, page 31. Let's not forget, brethren. The Advent Movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in this country, there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the loud cry of the third message. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. What I'm suggesting to you that as we approach the end of the world. We've been proclaiming a message. Revelation 14, the three angels' message, the third angel's message, a message of warning, preparation, and arousal. And as we approach the time period when the Lord is going to put his people into the purification process that they were put into here between 1840 and 1844, this is a purification process according to Daniel 12 and according to uh, Sister White. When it comes time for us to come to the end of the world and enter into this parallel uh, purification process, we should expect to see the same characteristics. And I'm suggesting to you that once again, 
we have from Bible prophecy, this one, I didn't put it up there, I, didn't, I should have, this one is Revelation 9.15, but this one down here, Daniel 11.40, once again, a collapse of a great empire, and we've been through that, the great empire that collapsed in 1989, none other than the Soviet Union, that was designed by God to bring power into the Advent movement. But there was a difference. The difference is, what's the difference? We're Laodiceans, and the Millerites were Philadelphians. The, the purpose of this verse was missed because we've decided to sleep on. Now, many of you in here are familiar with the Adventist pastor from Australia who's been deceased for quite some time now named Louis Weir. In the 1950s, he wrote a little booklet on Daniel 11, verse 40, and based upon Daniel 11, verse 40, he predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union in the very near future based on verse 40, and he said that it would be brought about through, by an alliance between the Vatican and the Protestant powers. <laughs> he, was, he was right on. Now, what would have happened if the Seventh-day Adventist Church would have took that little booklet and said, this is our message in the 1950s? Well, in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, the Adventist church would have looked very foolish. But when the Soviet Union was swept away overnight through an alliance between the Vatican and the United States, power would have came into the movement because everybody looked at that happen. And then they would have remembered, oh, that's exactly what those Adventists were saying for the last 30 years. But we're Laodiceans. We're not Philadelphians. And now it's... 15 years later, and we're still sleeping on. There is a work of sacred importance for ministers and peop people to do. They are to study the history of the cause and people of God. They are not to forget the past dealing of God with his people. They are to revive and recount the truths that have come to seem of little value to those who do not know by personal experience the power and brightness that accompanied them when they were first seen and understood. In all their original freshness and power, these truths are to be given to the world. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, the midnight cry. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. In the summer of 1844, midway between the time when it had first been thought the 2300 days would end. When it was it first thought the 2300 days would end? 1843. Midway between 1843... And the autumn of, that, of the same year, to which it was afterward found they extended, the message was proclaimed in the very words of Scripture, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Somewhere between 1843 and October 22nd, 1844, midway, this happens. It happens again. Review and Herald, February 11th, 1896. There is a world lying in wickedness and deception and delusion in the very shadows of death. Asleep, asleep. Who are filling the travail of souls to awaken them? What voice can reach them? My mind was carried to the future when the signal will be given, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. I had a brother in Oklahoma insisting um, that my taking histories out of the Bible and out of the history of Adventism and bringing them down to the end of the world was incorrect that those histories were valid, but only as moral lessons, not as in um, laying out future history. And when I took him to a few quotes like this, where, um, she, I mean, you can't get around this, can you? She's saying that, behold, the bridegroom cometh, it's going to be sounded again in the future, right? And I took him to a few quotes like that. You know what his response to me was? And it was with this tone of voice. He says, Jeff, you know as well as I do that Sister White was a careless writer. And that was my, when my conversation with him ended. And somebody here, I think, took up the rest of the conversation. But I was done with it. But brothers and sisters, this is too crystal clear. This isn't careless writing. There comes a point in the future when the midnight cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, experience is repeated. That's what she's saying. What, ha what brought the midnight cry into being in the Millerite movement. That which led to this movement was the discovery that the decree of Artaxerxes for the restoration of Jerusalem, which formed the starting point for the 2300 days, went into effect in the autumn of the year 457 and not at the beginning of the year, as had been formally believed. 
Reckoning from the autumn of 457, the 2300 years terminate in the autumn of 1844, and it continues on to say that as they got to that point in their reasoning, then they begin to look at the sanctuary and the feast days, and they realize that on October 22nd of that year would be the Day of Atonement, and they had it zeroed in. But what led to this um, experience was this new light. It was new light. They hadn't seen the starting point for the 2300 days so so clearly. So this is new prophetic light, right? You, we all see that. In their time period, it was new prophetic light. But it was directly connected to their message. This wasn't new light on the trumpets. It was new lights on Daniel 8.14, which was their message. New light based on the message they were proclaiming. And the new light allowed them to calculate October 22, 1844. And what happened on October 22, 1844? The door closed on the virgins. So the dynamics of the midnight cry in the Millerite time period, it's threefold at least. New light from Bible prophecy based upon the very message that they had been proclaiming. And when that new light is fulfilled, the door closes on the virgins of the Millerite movement. We all straight on that. You see the points I'm pulling out of there. Okay. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut, Matthew 25. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Brothers and sisters, here's two testimonies, two witnesses, saying that on October 22nd, 1844, the door was shut on the virgins. Two inspired references in the Bible, let alone how many times Sister White says it. Early Writings, page 56. And you, we've been listening to Russell um, refer to this right here often. I turned to look at a company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and draw back and deceive God's children. There was a purification process, and one group ended up carrying the doctrines of Rome. And one group entered in by faith into the most holy place with Christ, carrying the doctrines of Christ. They still had some growth, but that's what was going on, a separation process between those people. Crest Collection, 114. There was a purification, a separation that took place at the climax of the second angel's message. And it says he will purify his church even as he purified the temple at the beginning and the close of his ministry. The next one we've read before. Sister White talks about the, speaks about the two temple cleansings and she specifically ties them to the second and fourth angel's message. Christ cleanses temple at the end of the world for the first time on October 22nd, 1844. He does it again when the fourth angel's message arrives in history. And when is that? It's at the Sunday law in the United States. The fourth angel joins the third. The door is shut. The virgins are separated. So I suggest to you that what we, would ne what we should expect to see here in the scenario of the end of the parable of the ten virgins that's repeating the first time the parable of the ten virgins arrives in history, I would suggest that in this time period, when once again we're going to have the midnight cry, that we should be looking for new light, new prophetic light, that's based upon the very message that we're proclaiming. And what's our message? It's the third angel's message. The whole, the whole three angels' message, but most specifically, it's a warning about receiving the mark of the beast. And when that message arrives in history, this new prophetic light based upon our message, we should expect to see the do door closing upon the virgins of Adventism. And brothers and sisters, this collapse of the great empire, I should have had it written up here, was Daniel 11.40. And this new pro prophetic light 
is Daniel 11, verse 41. Because this is new prophetic light identifying when the Sunday Law arrives in history. It's directly connected with our message. And when it is fulfilled in history, the door closes on the virgins of Adventism. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming down with the little book open as we speak. And this is the verses that he's opening to God's people if they will see it. And if they refuse to see it, at some point in that decision-making process, they will be forced to proclaim that it is darkness. This message brings division based on past history. Third angel's message. Reviewing here, October 31st, 1899. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the message of the first and second angels refused the third, the last testing message to be given to the world. And a similar position will be taken when the last call is made. And we've already read, a time will come when the door will be shut, manuscript releases. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. And the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers. It, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation. So now, a sudden and unlooked for calamity. Something that brings the soul face to face with death will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. When does probation close for Seventh-day Adventists? At the Sunday law. At Seventh-day Adventists, I submit to you that Seventh-day Adventists, even the ones that aren't preparing for the Sunday law, they realize when the Sunday law comes, they're going to realize that it was life or death right then and there. They're going to know it. They're going to know it. And then they're going to demonstrate, we're going to demonstrate the character that we've prepared for that time. She continues on, saddest of all words that ever fell on mortal, mortal ears are those words of doom. I know you not. We cannot be ready to meet the Lord by waking when the cry is heard, behold, the bridegroom cometh and then gathering up our empty lamps to have them replenished. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. Uh, I've had opportunity to try to um, emphasize that point through the years. I mean, to me, this is an important point that character is demonstrated in Christ. So let, me, let me summarize this first before I say that. Daniel 11, 40 to 45, brothers and sisters, it matches perfectly with the message that brought about uh, the midnight cry in the pioneer time period. And I would challenge anyone to find another passage in prophecy that fits so well, a collapse of a great empire, followed by a verse that provides new prophetic light directly connected to the message that we proclaim. And when that new prophetic light is fulfilled in history, the door closes on the virgins. There just isn't any. This is the message. This is the little book open. So, so we've been sharing the past day and a half or so just the overview of the last six verses of Daniel 11 from Daniel 11 itself, and I want you to think about it. This is a defense for those last six verses from history. You know, this, this is history. Is, the history of the Millerite movement is allowing us to confirm the soundness of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, just from history. But the, probably the, the, one of the most, if not the most important lessons of all of this is that when the Sunday law arrives, we're going to demonstrate the character that we prepared prior to that time. And, and I've, I've had opportunities to speak about that many times over the past years. And uh, you often wonder, you know, what is it that brings you face to face with death and what you would do? And you, so you're, 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 you're emphasizing it. You know it's true. Um, but until it happens, you just don't know. And I'm here to tell you, as of this year, it can happen at any time. You don't expect it, and it can happen. Because for me, when I was kidnapped 
and they were sticking the guns in my face, I was face to face with death because I know what goes on in Colombia. And the, the Colombian police confirmed it to me, and the brethren at the prophecy school that live in Colombia confirmed it to me. There's two things that happen to you when you get kidnapped down there. You either get sold to the guerrillas or you die. No third options. And within about three or four hours, I was out of the car and walking down the street. Now, I didn't have anything, but I was free and... Uh, and the Lord had placed me into a crisis where I was face to face with death. And I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, that you and I, we can't wait to the Sunday law. It could happen today. We can have that crisis today. And I think if we're going to take this message and apply it to ourselves personally here and now, we have to ask ourselves, is this the light from the little book that Jesus is bringing down in fulfillment of Revelation 18? And it is, and if you determine it is, then it demands that you and I prepare the character that will glorify God even when somebody has a gun sticking in your face. And we can't put off that preparation. We can't do it. Because in this time period of history, if we choose to put it off for a day or a week, we'll find ourselves saying that light is darkness. That's part of the lesson of that history. We can't vacillate. We can't stand on the fence. The angel's coming down. It's getting ready to go to the whole world. Even if most of our comrades in arms within the church aren't recognizing this manifestation. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the history that you've preserved for us that we can understand what's about to take place here and now. We thank you for the faithfulness of those in that movement that followed you wherever you went. And we ask that uh, we be among those here at the end that follow you as well. We want to be there on the right side of the issue when you come in the clouds, this time in your second coming. And we thank you for how you've been feeding us here this week, how you've been stimulating our thoughts and bringing conviction upon our hearts. Please continue to do so, do so throughout this school, throughout this day. Please continue to have your angels and spirit attending here. And we submit once again those of us that may be um, under the weather that you would continue to bring us up to health, um, that we can have clear minds. And we thank you for the privilege of being here. And... Uh, for blessing us so far along this uh, school. In Jesus' name, amen.